Thank you for joining us today on behalf of the Human Rights Institute at Columbia Law School. And I'd like to thank our partners in organizing this event, Columbia University's Alliance for Historical Dialogue and Accountability and the Institute for uh, the Study of Human Rights. This event is the first in a series uh, of events on culture and human rights curated by the Human Rights Institute here at the law school. Um, the series brings together influencers, activists, and scholars from around the world to share critical perspectives and innovative approaches in the area of culture and human rights with a focus on resistance, protection, and priorities. My name is Maya Al-Kateb Shami, and I'm the Managing Director of the Human Rights Institute. My country, Syria, is struggling with ongoing conflict and dealing with massive displacement and vast atrocities. So I feel truly privileged to have been able to curate this panel with experts from the Global South um, who have uh, worked with the question of memory, memorialization, and transitional justice. And I'm looking forward to learning from them today. Uh, this event uh, will uh, raises the question of, of how they've worked and what tools they've used to bring about transitional justice and preserve the heritage of nations in turmoil. We are honored to host today uh, three experts um, whom I'll introduce. Milena Duran um, is an oral historian who focuses on recent history and memory, and an educator and archivist with Abuelas de Plaza de Mayo, or the Grandmothers of Plaza de Mayo, a non-governmental organization that searches for the children, or today adults, who were kidnapped and, appropri and appropriated during the last military dictatorship in Argentina. Francis Opio um, is a transitional justice practitioner in northern Uganda who, having experienced the effects of war firsthand, is working to further memorialization and, preserve, uh, and preservation of victims' stories as central pillars of transitional justice. And Reina Milat Sarkis is a human rights-focused psychoanalyst who works towards the construction of a Lebanese identity built from a collective memory as the nation continues to cope with its violent past. Reina has contributed to establishing a ministry for human rights in Lebanon, and her work on living memory include, includes providing psychotherapy to victims of torture. All of um, our guest speakers today are fellows uh, with Columbia University's Alliance for Historical Dialogue and Accountability, and we're so privileged uh, to have them here with us today. Thank you. So I'm going to start with a, a general question to you. Could you please tell us about your work in the areas uh, of memory, memorialization, and transitional justice? And perhaps with a focus on what is it, why is it that you do what you do? And what do you think that work um, what do you think is the impact on um, reconciliation at the community level, um, benefits to individuals, and maybe even um, justice involving different communities? I guess let's start with Reina. So, um, yeah, hello. Um, I'm, um, so yeah, I'm a psychoanalyst and a researcher. I worked and studied between uh, Paris and Beirut. Um, I didn't just wake up one day and decide to uh, explore truth and reconciliation commissions. These things don't happen like that. I come from a country that, know, that has known uh, 15 years of civil war. And suspended in 1990, it's not over. Uh, I, no I started noticing things in my private practice. I would see patients on the divan uh, who would come with, uh, let's say, regular neurosis, but we would have outbursts of uh, war-related traumas. And I took notice of this because a lot of things came out from, you know, from my practice in private. I also noticed the same thing when I was giving group therapy to an LGBT, LGTB group, uh, and also LGBT, sorry, and also the patients who were here for completely irrelevant reasons, uh, like different reasons, their own life, their own struggles, and all that. 
also had outbursts of symptoms related to war trauma. Um, so I always got involved one way or the other with projects related to human rights violation and war conflict, uh, past conflict. Um, so throughout the years, I collaborated with different NGOs. I ended up founding three myself or co-founding three of those. Um, the turning point so that got me to transitional justice issues and truth and reconciliation justice uh, submissions was in 2005, uh, after the assassination of uh, former Prime Minister of Lebanon, uh, Rafi Hariri, who was assass assassinated in 2005, and that triggered the Cedar Revolution. So in a country of four million, you have 1.5 million Lebanese who took to the streets, uh, and everybody was demanding the truth. They wanted to know the truth behind the assassination and you know everything that led to it, which is a long history. And it, right after the Cedar Revolution, there was a whole series of assassinations. So basically all the tenors of the revolution were eliminated. One of them was Samir Tassir, who is an intellectual journalist, I'm sure you know him and who was a dear friend, and that really shook me. It took me out of my <coughs> private practice, and I started gathering with friends and colleagues and started contemplating the possibility of a truth and reconciliation commission for Lebanon. And, you know, I, I did the whole detour, and little by little, I started noticing that uh, it was not really feasible at the time to take it to the level where it needs to go in order for it to be what it should be what we understand by transitional justice or TRCs. And in one of these panels, like very much one like this one, I met my first to be torture victim who became my patient and then I formed this group. So then I did that and I had to collaborate with yet another NGO. And this is where I noticed that there is a big chaos in Lebanon, in my country, when it comes to the organization of NGOs, how they work together, how they don't work together, it's very problematic, especially in light of the exponentially getting worse human violations uh, with 1.5 mi million Syrian refugees, uh, 200,000 Palestinian refugees, women's rights and whatnot, like really on every level. So this is when I created in 2014 MOHR, which is supposed to push for a <coughs> meta structure for human rights in Lebanon. Yes, is that, this is what gave the ministry, but it could have been, I don't know, a national committee, a national commission, some form that triangulates the situation just to get better results, to be more efficient. Because, you know, if you need an open heart surgery, I cannot come and put a Band-Aid on your finger, which is a bit what NGOs do, you know, they're very good, but they're, ex they're very precise in their mission and their scope and all that. So we needed something more comprehensive. So this is how I got to, you know, doing what I do today. And now I'm focused on two main projects. Um, one is to bring human rights education to Lebanon uh, in collaboration, hopefully, with, you know, uh, big authorities in the field. Uh, I'm really pushing for that and I hope it works because I know the country needs it. And the second project is to continue and to expand the support of mental health for torture victims and conflict victims. So that's why I do what I do. Well, hi. Thank you very much for, I don't know if this is, <laughs> thank you very much for the invitation. Um, well, my name is Milena Duran. I work at a human rights organization in Argentina that's called Abuelas de Plaza de Mayo, Grandmothers of Plaza de Mayo. This organization was born in 1977 during the years of the last military dictatorship in Argentina um, with the aim of finding and restoring to their legitimate families those children that were appropriated during uh, the years of, of the dictatorship that were between the 76 and the 83. Uh, we estimate that 500 children were appropriated during those years. Grandmothers Today is an organization that has over 40 years of work and has uh, solved 130 cases and still has more than 
and 300 children, grandchildren, to find that today they're not children anymore, but they're adults that are around uh, 40 years. And so the search not only is for the grandchildren, but also for the great-grandchildren, who also see their right to identity uh, violated. I, uh, well, my idea today was to talk about my specific work in that organization that is in the oral history uh, archive of the institution. This oral history archive was created in 1998. Uh, it has 20 years. And it was created in the combined effort between uh, Abuelas de Plaza de Mayo and the Buenos Aires University. I think this is something that's important to point out because since we are today talking in a university, uh, it's important uh, that I point out that in Argentina, national university had a very big uh, role in the memorialization process that has almost now uh, 40 years, more than 40 years. Um, so the, the family biographical archive was uh, created with uh, the goal or the aim of reconstructing the life stories of the disappeared or the day the grandchildren uh, were found. For them, uh, to get to know in, in some way who were their biological parents who they never got to know uh, because they disappeared. Uh, so with that objective, what we do is interview family members, uh, friends, activist fellows, um, school partners, anyone that shared <coughs> life or part of their lives with the disappeared and that can tell us how they were in their more intimate uh, aspects. Because what <coughs> we figured out at the moment of the creation of the archive, um, what, what the grandmother figured out, because I, I, um, I started working with the archive much years, uh, many years later, uh, is that what that aspect of the, the private or the more intimate aspect of the lives of the disappeared was the one mostly unknown by their children. Uh, so when we gather a number of interviews that we consider reflect the different stages or phases of the lives of the disappeared, uh, the grandmothers themselves give that material, that archive, to their grandchildren in a very intimate and uh, act that, that we do uh, in the house of the, of the abuelas. The main objective or the wider goal of, of this archive, thinking of the role that, that this project, this work has uh, in the memorialization process, is, well, first to give a tool to these restored grandchildren that find out 40 years later that they grew up uh, believing a story that wasn't true, thinking they were children from people they were around. So the main objective is to give them a tool to approach their biological families and to approach their, the history of their families. Um, we believe it's a form, or I believe it's a form of reparation, right? Because not only for the restored grandchildren that, that access in that way their history, but also for their siblings or cousins that are also children of the disappeared and also receive this material. Every time we have a family that has not only their restored grandchildren but brothers and also cousins, children of the disappeared, we give them this material so they can also get to know the story of their family. And this is something that um, is directly a consequence of what happens in societies that went through and forced disappearance. And it's that the families that suffer those disappearance of their loved ones usually tend to cover that history and their disappear, the, his, the stories of the disappeared under uh, a, a silence, a cloak of silence. And so for those children that weren't appropriated, that were raised by their biological families, their grandparents, their uncles, their aunts, 
also it's very difficult for them to ask because of the fear that remains in that family, because of the painful that it is for those for relatives to talk about because of fear. Many times for them it was very difficult to ask in their biological families about their parents. So for them it's also very important to receive that material and many times new information. Um, but also finally in this function, this discretization role that the archive has. It's also very important for the, for all the interviewees that we meet because when, first of all, the work, when we started, when, when the archive started with its work, was planned very carefully because it was meant to speak with victims of the dictatorship. Uh, and so the fact that we go to see families wherever they are in different points of the country. Argentina is a very big country. So the fact to go to different and, and, and distant places, see the families, sit with them hours, sometimes even days when we travel, we stay in their homes, we, we stay with them days. It's, uh, it's repairing for them also because it's a way to authorize their voices and also bring the hope that one day that record, that voice, will get to the hands of the restored grandchildren. In a social level, again, in a social level, the archive, although it's private and so it's not public or access, uh, it's not open for public access or for researchers, um, it is used as a source of information for judicial investigations, for educational materials, as a base for theater monologues, or uh, even for us, for memorials. So I think all that activity that, uh, that, that happened, uh, that, that we have a lot in, in Argentina of activities of memorialization, uh, I, strongly, I strongly believe that those activities, in a way, raise awareness Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Maya, for the great introduction. And uh, I would like to say thank you to everyone for uh, coming out to you know, listen to our stories and what we do back home. As Maya mentioned, my name is uh, Francis Opio. I come from northern Uganda and uh, the northern part of northern, uh, northern Uganda, for that matter. And just like uh, Maya said, I experienced the Lord's Resistance Army War firsthand. Um, you know, by firsthand I mean, you know, listening to the gunshots every day you wake up and every day you go to sleep. And also having to, you know, seek refuge in bushes, nearby bushes, um, around the, the home states or within the vicinities of uh, our of our home or within the district as well, because there were a lot of things that happened that some people had to commute and either go seek refuge in town, you know, with urban centers, or, you know, go to a nearby valley or shrub and make sure that you're okay. So that experience gave me the passion or gives me the passion to do what I do. And that led me to work with a number of organizations non-profit organizations in, uh, in Northern Uganda. Currently, I'm working with the Foundation for Justice and Development Initiatives. And uh, the goal of the organization is to promote justice, development, and uh, economic recovery of uh, war-affected communities. What that means in practice is that um, one of the activities we do is advocacy for redress for the human rights violations that happened during, you know, the Lord's Resistance Army War for over 21 years. And then uh, we also promote um, sustainable development initiatives and facilitate um, economic uh, empowerment programs within, you know, victim affected communities. Now, to get into the nuts and bolts of uh, what Maya asked, um, I'd like to give you a little bit of context, you know, Uganda in pre- and post-colonial days, both 
uh, in both regimes, the, the pre-colonial and the post-colonial, we were ravaged by various conflicts. And I wouldn't want to go so much into the details of the conflicts because I don't think we have a lot of time. But um, the longest one, the Lord's Resistance Army War, that was essentially a conflict between you know, the rebel group, the LRA, and the government of Uganda, by far, <coughs> in my opinion, was the longest and the most disastrous. Why do I say this? Um, thousands of people were massacred. 1.5 million people were displaced. Over 60,000 children were abducted to work as sex slaves, child soldiers, and uh, you know, do heinous acts while they were in captivity. Now, despite all you know, the human rights violations, the destruction and loss that people face, none of the governments, past or present, in Uganda today has seriously dealt with the question of memory. Don't get me wrong, they have done something, but I don't think they have been serious enough to address the issues around memory and memorization. Well, various villages in northern Uganda were faced with massacres. Very few memorials exist to remember these people. Now that brings me to what I do, okay? As a human being, you know, given my past experience, I, I you know, my passion is in, you know, making sure that people recover from uh, the violent past that they experience. So, Currently, at the Foundation for Justice, what I do is oversee documentation of testimonies, documentation of uh, uh, narratives, life stories, documentation of um, timelines of events. Because these are things that people do not pay attention to for some reason. And then also collect artifacts, both war weaponry artifacts and cultural artifacts. And why do we collect these? It's because we have a reason that these artifacts and testimonies and narratives in a way facilitate acknowledgement. Today, as I speak, we have established a small community memory center in, um, uh, it's about 17 kilometers outside Gulu. And uh, it's used to preserve all these documentations and artifacts that we've collected. And for us, this is a way to preserve, first of all, uh, the history of the, you know, the conflict, but also promote acknowledgement among victims. That we have this space that when you come in, you're, you know, you, you, you're ready to reckon with your past. That facilitates acceptance. Through ac acceptance, you then get to reconcile with your past and therefore heal, finally. Besides the acknowledgement part, I think there's a ton of a younger generation that was displaced into internally displaced camps. They don't know whatsoever happened. They were produced in camps. They grew up in camps. They don't know anything that happened to their parents. So this particular center, or what we do, is to promote learning for the younger generation, and also researchers like all of us in here in this room today, or academics. Okay, and then finally, I think the greater importance of us doing memory is to promote accountability. Accountability for the crimes, the human rights violations that happened during the war. By documenting narratives, by documenting testimonies, these, we believe at some point, can be used as evidence before court, before any criminal tribunal. So in a nutshell, this is why I do what I do, and I'm very passionate about it. Uh, yeah, so. May I push you a little harder on, on the why? Okay. So some may argue that when horrible things happen, like those that you mentioned, we should just pick up and move on and get over it and focus on the future in a positive and optimistic way. What do you think of that theory? To be honest, um, I mean, you can quote me on this. I, I don't believe in that theory. Why? Because um, 
You know, I want, I want to think of memory in this. All of us have vehicles, or, or some of us have vehicles in this room, right? So come think of memory or what happened in the past as a vehicle. Now, in a vehicle, we have a windshield, the larger one, on the front, right? And that is supposed to let us see the future. But then on that vehicle, we also have side mirrors. And also we have the, the, the rear view side mirror right here on the front, right? And then we have that plain mirror out behind. So if we could stop for a second and try to understand why the manufacturer, like Ford, for example, thinks that we need to have side mirrors, OK? Side mirror, actually. There are actually four of them, and we have one big windscreen at the front. I think for me, working in this field, I think this is to tell us that the continuous engagement with our past does not stop when you pass an object, when you're on your, on your way somewhere. I think there is need for us to continuously engage with our past, okay? And that is why we have the side mirrors everywhere, that when you pass something, you might say, wow, okay, and then you look back and say, what was that, okay? That tells us that uh, as practitioners, there is need for us to continuously engage with our past. And why do we continuously engage with our past? Is that when we do that, we are able to actually envision the future or where we are going or we are destined to be, okay? And then, I mean, let's face it, guys. A wound has to be cleared, okay? and redress. Why do you always go back to the hospital to your doctor to redress your wound when you get a problem? It's because when you, when you have a wound, it has to be cleansed, redressed, to allow for proper healing. In the words of Winston Churchill, he tells us, quote, that the more far back one can look, the more far forward he or she is able to, 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 to see. So for me, I think uh, we need to be able to constantly engage with our past to be able to actually see the future that we want to see. Thank you. Abena, you work with torture victims. How about at the individual level? I mean, should we move forward or? Well, you're asking the wrong person. I mean, past is my profession. That's what I do. I'm a shrink. <laughs> I'm always in the past. Uh, but only because it catches up with the present. The past doesn't belong to the past always. We go back to it in order to move forward, as Francis was saying with the, with the nice metaphor. But I'll give you an example. Like when I, when I started working with the, when I started interviewing the torture victims, you know, because you need to do preliminary uh, sessions in order to form a group. You know, group therapy has some rules, some. Uh, regulations, you need a coherent group, you want uh, the members of the group to have something in common, either shared experience, age, sex, something like they need, you need to build the group that makes sense. <coughs> so I was interviewing all these patients and, and I, it was individual meetings, just to meet them, to get to know them. And I was doing my regular questionnaire, uh, like medical history, um, where, when were you abducted? How long were you put away? Are you married? Uh, drug, alcohol, you know, drug problem, alcohol problem. You know, just everything, the, the regular uh, routine questionnaire. And then at the very end, I was asking each and every one of them, what is it that you expect from, you know, from this therapy that you're about to start if, if we work together? I was really taken aback. I mean, I really did not expect this answer because Almost every one of them, maybe not in the same words, but sometimes in the same words, they were telling me, I, I would like to be able to hope again. I mean, even now when I mention this, I get goosebumps so much for a psychology, for a psychoanalyst neutrality, but really, I mean it. And I panic because like, how am I going to survive this? I couldn't even guarantee that. But these men came to look back in their past in order to hope for the future. Like when you hope, it means that you're looking forward, that you're projecting yourself because they were unable to project their, themselves in the future because of what happened to them in the past. 
And it wasn't only that. It's the fact that their past is, in fact, their present. Like, what they are today, who they are, is not, they don't say, I was a victim of torture. They say, I am a victim, a victim of torture. It's the only identity they have. Their past is the only option they have. They don't know how to exist otherwise. And I remember in the very early group sessions that I gave them, it was a bit premature for them to hear. I tried to suggest, like, okay, you're, you're, a, you're a torture victim, but you're also a torture survivor. And nobody could hear it. I mean, I was inviting them to look forward, like to imagine or to project themselves into a different identity, but they declined the, the <laughs> invitation. And they were quite aggressive and quite passionate in their responses because, and I understand because it would have created a vacuum for in their identity because all they know what to be is based on their past experience is being a victim. If you take that away from them and there's, you don't give time for them to go back to the past, to explain what they went through, uh, to, to recount what happened to them, you know, the whole reparation, etc. They're not able to deconstruct this in order to build something else instead. So you cannot, I mean, your past is who you are. It's your identity, it's your memory. It constitutes your psyche. It, constitu it constitutes how you perceive yourself. So if, if you don't have a stable, it's your platform on which you project and on which you're able to look forward. If this is not healthy enough, um, or if it's not there, if you're not aware of it, it's not possible to, you move forward because time passes, but you're not able to repair or to become your optimum self, or at least be less miserable. I mean, you know, it's, it's all very, very intricated. Um, I'll stop at that unless, you know, we could go back later because there's so much to say, you know, about these thematics specifically and, you know, when you're having a psychoanalytical approach to things in relation to memory and identity. Thanks for your response. Um, have a specific question to Milena. You mentioned that your work is very specific related to an incident in working with a grandmother. So. Societies often need to grapple with a very difficult question of what to remember about the past. How do you go, what is your approach? What, how would, you know, what do you think about the question of what history to remember and what memory to choose? Uh, um, it's a very broad question, so I'm gonna try to be short. Um, when you think about what, hit, what history uh, actually, you're talking about which memory or narrative about past events. Uh, and think about that, and to think about that, we have to also consider two issues. First of all, that societies are complex, have different sectors, have different groups. Uh, each group has, has their own narrative or can have their own narrative about that past. And also that those narratives can change over time. I think uh, in that, Argentina is a very good case to think about this. Uh, first of all, because the conflict uh, was uh, 30 more, I think, almost 40 years ago in difference with uh, Uganda or Lebanon. So it's a very good case to think about that. But you have to consider this in two things. because we are talking about memories, and memories change over time, also about the past events. Um, I believe it depends uh, in, in the immediate moment after the conflict. It depends very much on what case you take, the nature of the conflict, how that conflict ended, which are the actors in that post-conflict scenario, and what are the power relationships between those actors. Um, so, for example, because why I, I, I bring this uh, power relationship between these actors, because each of these actors have their own narrative, and in that power relationship between them, there's a push between those, those, those interpretations, right? So, for example, in Argentina, in the immediate, uh, after, immediately after this 
dictatorship ended in the first half of the 80s. It ended at the end of 83. Uh, well, the Argentine dict military dictatorship collapsed. Collapsed. So just to think about how this ended. And uh, uh, in, in contrast with other American, uh, Latin American cases, for example, Chile or, for example, Uruguay, our dictatorship ended collapsing after a very big political, economical, social crisis that was also accelerated by the Falklands uh, War, that uh, the defeat on the Falklands War uh, against the UK. Uh, so in that scenario, in that, uh, in that con condition, for the military, it was a very bad decision for them to negotiate or to impose the narrative that they uh, defended that was that the crimes committed were, was, were part of uh, an anti-suicide war. And on the other side, we had uh, many national and international, national human rights organizations that had the support of important international human rights organizations. And so the voices of the victims uh, stood up very strongly and press the new democratic government for um, the judgment of the, the, the judgment of this of this crimes in what was uh, a big trial called the trial to the to the junta to the to the junta. Um, despite this fight, this this fast response from the government and the justice after a series a series of military uprising, uh, the government decided at the half of the 80s to go backwards. And so after that, we had 20 years that the victims had to wait until the, the, the trial against the repressors and the, persons, the, the perpetrators uh, could be reopened. And in, that, in those years, also the topic of the dictatorship in Argentina also remained practically untouched in educational environments, in cultural environments, in society in general. So um, I, I think that even when we uh, think about the issue of the children's appropriation, uh, you can also see these changes. Because when the, when the dictatorship ended, uh, the issue about the appropriation, the children's appropriation, that was a very uh, under, like uh, unexplainable crime that this military committed, uh, was seen by the society as uh, a very important human rights violation. And then, after in, in this in this uh, phase or uh, of impunity for the military. Society started to see, started to see, or there was a common sense of um, very related to what we spoke recently on the first question. Well, those children are already with another family. Why are we going to take back? Why are we going to uh, bring them back or give them back to the biological families if they if they are already being raised by another family that gives them love, that, that gives them all their needs? So why to look back? Why don't we start looking forward? And Abuelas uh, from this place uh, was fought um, a lot with this, with this conception because we believe that no uh, relationship of, of love and caring can be built on a life, on a life to those children. Uh, we had to wait until the end of the 90s for the memory uh, thematic or what a lot of specialists called a memory boom and a reopen of the memory uh, of, of the memory uh, debates or conversations. So I think um, that, that it, it, you have to uh, see the different stages, consider the different national and national causes that take a society to review their past 
or to try to forget it, and also see how that society reads into that conflict. From the first years of the 2000s, because of the intense work of the human rights organizations, but also because the state started to uh, define what happened during the dictatorship as state terrorism, and started to responsabilize it, to, 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 to feel responsible for that, and to carry out very uh, different human rights policies in education, in uh, memorials, in books and films. Uh, since then, with the, the work of the state and the work of the organization, is that we can, uh, we can talk about a memory that considers those years as state terrorism in a very clear way. Um, and then uh, a related question is also the timing of memorize, you know, remem of remem remembrance. So what do you do in the case of prolonged conflict? And uh, do you remember after the conflict has ended? Or when after? So, yes. yes, I just want to make one thing clear that um, I think memory is not just about the bad history, okay? Um, in my case, people, a, one young um, female abductee told me that for her, she constantly remembers the day she delivered her first child. Now, that is a good memory. You know, we tend to associate memory with, uh, you know, only the bad things, which is not necessarily true, like memory, and that goes back to what you choose, what you choose to memorize. Some people choose to memorize the good stuff, the day they had their first born, or others choose to memorize when they witnessed the killing, for example. Now, in case of prolonged memory, to go back to your point, um, I think as practitioners, it's very important for us to continuously document. Because sometimes it's very, very difficult for us to do what we do right now when uh, there are bombs falling, there are bullets flying, and people are being displaced here and there. What we can do as humans is to ensure that the records of these things is kept in whichever form, whether nowadays we have um, you know, smartphones, right? So you can document something if uh, a police is brutalizing someone, for example, on the street. Um, you can, you can, you know, journal, you know, like, yes, you're displaced, you're somewhere in your corner, you can tend to uh, <coughs> jot down whatever you remember about that stuff. Because at some point, whatever you've written down is going to play into the history narrative, and it's going to probably do someone justice. As I say, you know, part of why people remember is to ensure that sometimes accountability is done. And that, if we don't do that, of course, when, just to answer that thing, that the danger of forgetting is that sometimes justice can't be gotten, you know, because people have forgotten everything. So I think for me, in terms of prolonged uh, conflict, the best we can do is just document. Because with documentation, a lot can be done. I have a question um, at the intersection of the legal and cultural sphere. How do you see remembrance and memorialization efforts working alongside criminal justice, or justice efforts in general that involve punishing the perpetrator of punishment? Um, what is the relationship between these approaches? I'm, I'm going to answer your question a little bit, but I have to, I have to share something with you because it's also related, because culture is also related to memory in so many ways. When I was uh, doing all this research about Truth and Reconciliation Commission, I, I had to read a lot, and I stumbled on so many names for memory and so many adjectives that came with it. I found exactly 94 combination of something with memory, uh, like the cycle of memory, dangerous memory, repetition of memory, um, competition of memory, wounded memory, traumatized memory, it's, never, it's really 94, and the last one was the exhaustion of memory. And I found only two words for forgiveness, one that is called uh, oblivion, for, no, forget, to forget, oblivion, yeah. uh, 
cellularly and furnished that's all I found so I think if you do a bond I mean if you do search the case that we're trying to do here about talking about the past addressing memory and that gets us to you know the the legal issues like when you're doing it, the first thing when you are in the tribunal is you investigate so therefore you go back and you see what happened and what didn't happen to make justice and to repair um, so I believe that we're talking now about truth and reconciliation commissions or transitional justice or you know these uh, these instances um, and regardless if justice is restorative or retributive I believe that the process of it has a therapeutical dimension. I believe when Elena was saying, when, you know, when they when they go to sit with these families, they are investigating. But she said that it has a, refer a reparative dimension to the families, and this is very true. This is the whole. Probably, this is what matters most. Of course, it matters to get justice in terms of you know those who committed the crimes end up in jail or in prison that they persecuted or amnesty. <coughs> truth. So I think that the process itself is healing and is has brings some repair, some acknowledgement, um, and also mends some of the wounds somehow. So whether it's I'm not a lawyer, so whether it be a restorative or retributive or all sorts of justice that you're better positioned to to argument. I think that the, 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 the process itself and the, the therapeutical dimension really are what it could be about, what matters truly. Um, you know, the cultural problem does pose an issue because when, when I try to do this comparative study in order to see if it's possible to have a PRC in Lebanon, um, it was very important to study the situation, to have a comparative study because you know, TRCs are not the franchise. It's not McDonald's, which is just for open branches, left, right, and center. You really have to, it's very complex. It has to be very precise. It has to take into consideration the context. It has to take into consideration culture, traditions, <coughs> you know, politics, uh, history. It takes, it's, it's really a heavy structure that is supposed to be tailor-made for the during it's going to be implemented and potentially. And it has keys of success. When you look at you know the, the TRCs that happened, you try to analyze what were the you know the factors that made it possible, what period did it cover, um, how did it approach, you know, what country did it choose geographically, you know, in terms of temporality, all these that all these are things to be defined by the context and by the actors. Um, the other tricky part in truth and reconciliation commission or trans transitional justice is the necessity of political will. It's not only, it's, it's a legal uh, system, it's a legal machine, but it needs to be mandated by the government. It needs, you need a law to, to allow it to happen. You need uh, the political will, and you, you need a victim and a perpetrator, you need a winner and a loser, you need, you know, factors that make it possible to exist. There are situations where these factors are not present. Um, and even in, in I, mean, I, can, I, can ex I can, maybe in the Q&A, I can explain a little bit the context of Lebanon, not because it, it's interesting in itself, but because you can see how, if you come from different countries, it would apply in your country. And you see what are the obstacles, the opportunities, the threats, the, you know, the weaknesses, the, you know, how, how, to, how to make it fit to your context. Um, there's also the cultural dimension that you mentioned. So culture differs, it, it differs tremendously, they can even be opposite. But let's say in South Africa, which is always like the, like the case study for TRCs, along with four or five, uh, four others, um, they have the Ubuntu, you know, the Desmond, the, the Desmond Tutu aura, you know, the Ubuntu notion, the philosophy of the humane approach, you know, the forgiveness. In Lebanon, for example, it, this doesn't fly, you know, culturally, we have something called fidya. Fidya means you have to compensate for the victim uh, either by paying an amount of money or giving land, or you have to do something to, like, you have to pay. It's like 
that almost as the closest trans trans translation I can find. So the culture differs a lot. And why TRCs and these instances, they, necess they, they need, they require uh, like a higher authority. They're also massively covered by the media usually. Um, they involve the larger public. It's a whole enterprise. When this is not possible, it never stops the cultural dialogue from happening, the historical dialogue from happening. And the exchange is there, and it's quite enriching, because at the end of the day, why do you do all this? You do all this to write history. It's how you remember what happened, it's memory. And memory and history are, are like uber politicized, because it's about who was strong enough to survive and then tell his side of what happened and then teach the generations about what happened. This is also what builds a common identity. That's how you have, that's why you have citizens who relate and who belong to the same country or to, you know, under, who, who relate in the same way to a flag. And if, if you have a divided memory like all the list that I'm not going to bore you with, but it's very interesting at the same time. I mean, I really find it boring. But uh, we end up with subject to quarrel and to continue to divide. It doesn't stop. I mean, in Lebanon, for example, we have a law that obliges schools to use a unified history book. Therefore, the schools are not teaching modern history. But the history in the books that are taught in schools, you have generations upon generations since the 40s who know nothing about modern Lebanon. The, the civil war is not mentioned. You don't know who did what, when, because there's no agreement, there's no consensus. And it really goes down to events, punctual events. Like, for example, we had the president of the, the president of our country was assassinated in 1982, Bashir Jemani. For half of the Lebanese, he's a martyr and a hero, and he should be celebrated as such. For the other half, He's a traitor who got what he deserved. How do you tell this? And if, you know, how do you write this? So this is the cultural clash that translates into how to write history, which is the whole point of, or one of the main uh, missions of transitional justice is to transit from one era to the other. I'm looking at the time. I'm going to start, I think yeah. we might have time for maybe one question, actually. So let's just do, Two, if you are very brief, and then we collect the questions first, and then see if we have answers. One and two. Okay, go ahead. Could you turn on your mic, please? Turn on the mic next to you. How about that? There we go. Yes, hi. And actually, here's the irony, because I was going to ask all of you to use the microphones. It's been hard to hear. Uh, but what I could hear um, uh, got me thinking about some, so what I love, why I love doing this work, in, at least in part, if I'm going to be honest with myself, is that I wasn't there. So I don't have the moral and ethical obligations of intervention, right? It happened already. But, um, sorry, Francis, I believe you, you raised the issue of what if you are present, right? So there is the document, documentation. So this is the human rights piece, right? Here's the documentation of an event, but what about the moral and ethical obligations to intervene? So I think journalism, journalists have this challenge all the time because they're present and they're, what they're seeing and they are, and they are documenting, but should they, have, should they have intervened if they could have? And so I was wondering about the intersections of the, the collecting, the, the archiving of memory when you are there in that moment and the intervention, the moral and ethical obligation to intervene if you can. Yeah, um, again, I'm going to draw from my experience active conflict. I think it's, it's a dilemma that um, each, uh, let's say, journalist or anyone who is present in that particular moment to choose whether to, to intervene or not, depending on whether it's going to put you at risk or it's not going to put you at risk. 
for many of us, for example, me, um, if, if, you, if you wanted to intervene, then that means you're either going to be abducted and killed. So do you want to put your life at risk? That is a choice that you have to make. Of course, there are certain times when people who were abducted stood up when you know, they were beating up the others and torturing them. But again, also, it's, it's a give or take. It's a give or take, honestly. Um, but uh, for me, the, the aspect of documentation is that uh, if you cannot intervene, then please just have something documented. Either write something down or, you know, to be able to pass it on. Most times in active conflict, it's very hard to intervene because mm -hmm. either you don't have the weapons to actually defend yourself or you, you're just vulnerable to the point that you don't even have that, that ability to make that choice anymore. Thank you for your question. I know we're running, we need to um, move to an, you know, because another class is taking place in, in the room, so I wanted to take a final moment to um, thank our speakers and ask you to join us.